what are we celebrating today? Well, today is International Clients Day. I have no idea what you're supposed to do with an internet. I guess if you're a client, today is your day. Today is National Backyard Day. I kind of feel like I celebrated this yesterday. Um, and you know what I realized about 3 o'clock in the morning? I ain't as young as I used to be. Man, I woke up in the middle of the night and my legs were cramping from running up and down that hill. And I realized I'm, I'm just not as young as I used to be. But today, if you didn't celebrate yesterday, today is the day to go out and play in your backyard or whatever you do in your backyard. Today is um, International Read to Me Day. So maybe you want to sit down and get somebody to read a good book to you. I don't know. Um, here's an important one. Today is National Certified Nurses Day. So if you are a certified nurse, we'd like to take a moment to say thank you for the hard work that you do and the way that you take care of it and keep our doctors straight. Because we know that's the main job of a nurse, to keep the doctor straight. Today is National Let's Laugh Day. <laughs> there you go. Didn't feel better? Yeah, I don't know. Hey, okay, here's one you can get into. Today is National Chocolate and Caramel Day. A holiday made for my wife, honestly. That's your two favorite food groups, isn't it? And if all of that fails, well, um, today is National Poultry Day. Now, I have no idea if that means you're supposed to eat more chickens or, you know, eat less chickens because I don't know. But there you go. So if you need something to do and something to celebrate, there are your holidays for today. And, you know, I read that list and, well... We celebrate some crazy things, don't we? And sometimes we celebrate in the weirdest ways. Think about this. We color eggs. We go and cut down trees. We dress up as weird creatures. We consume mountains of food more than we should be consuming in a lifetime, let alone in a single day. Sometimes our celebrations aren't too safe. Don't believe me? Come join me for the 4th of July. Fireworks, anyone? Most of our celebrations are way too expensive. And well, um, celebrations, sometimes we don't think we have time for them, but they do have value to them. They give us a moment to reflect. I mean, when we celebrate things, it sometimes makes us sit down and think about New Year's, we think about the year that's gone by. Christmas, we think about Jesus when, on his birth. Easter, we think about his his. his his death, burial, and resurrection. So it gives us a moment to sit back and just kind of reflect. Sometimes um, they bring together people we don't normally see. Now that can be a good or a bad thing, um, you know, but there are people that we only see once a year, right? Sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we get together and we see them. So it's all about the celebration. Um, they give us an excuse to take a day off. Woohoo! You know, at the beginning of the calendar year, our, our work puts it out. What are going to be the celebrated holidays by work? And you start Xing those things off your calendar because these are the days, because this is where you couple your PTO to turn a three day weekend into a four day weekend because we have an excuse to celebrate. Take a day off. Sometimes they often force us to make changes to our life. You know, those relatives are coming to visit, they got to have somewhere to sleep. You put that Christmas tree in your, in, your, in your living room, there's a piece of furniture that's got to go because your room is already full, right? Your schedule isn't the same when you are going to celebrate a holiday. So I'd like you to keep these four valuable lessons that we learn from holidays and celebrations in mind as today we begin to celebrate God. Psalm chapter 145, verses 3 through 5, Great is the Lord! and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commands your works to another. They tell your mighty acts. They speak of your glorious splendor, of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. We are in week three of this Leviticus chapter 23 study, and so far we've looked at two celebrations. We started out and we looked at the Sabbath. Well, and that was one that forced them to celebrate every seven days. Last week, we took a look at Passover. And that was the, the, the holiday, the, the celebration that was put in place to help them to remember the day that God passed over them and allowed them to live 
and be redeemed. And today, well, we're going to start the um, first multi-day festivals. And yeah, that um, word festival is in quotes because when I think festival, you know what comes to my mind, right? When I think festival, I think of an organized series of concerts, plays, or movies, typically one held annually in the exact same place. Yesterday was the Maple Festival. And it's in the same place, same time, every single year. It's something that's on there. It is something that put, you put on a calendar, and you go to it, and you go, and it's supposed to be festive. And when I think of festive, I think of fun. You know, you go, and they have cotton candy, and they have all the, 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 the caramel apples, and then they have the little booze and the games that you can play, and maybe there's some good music that you can... It's supposed to be fun, Right? So when God says, I'm going to give you some festivals, um, uh, that's, um, that's not what he's interested in. He's more interested in a day or a period of celebration, typically a religious commemoration. So in our third week and how God wants to ask his people to celebrate, we are going to look at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I want to tell you something, now you're in my ballpark. You talk about a celebration of bread, now that is a berry party. Because as much as Deborah likes caramel and chocolate, Barry loves bread. Matter of fact, when um, we were in Charlottesville, the minister's wife there, she was an awesome cook. And her specialty were these big, fluffy yeast rolls. And she'd make them things by the batch, and they were warm, and they were puffy, and, it's, and they were kind of smushy. And you could take those things and you could sit down with a jar of honey and a tub of butter, and it's called heaven. I mean, they were awesome. As a matter of fact, they would be the absolute perfect food for November 17th celebration. Y'all know what November 17th is, right? It is National Homemade Bread Day. Thus, if you want to celebrate this holiday, you make the bread, I'll bring the butter and the honey. Just give me a call. So this idea of celebrating bread. Cool. Let's look at how we celebrate bread. Here is what it says. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 6 through 8. On the 15th day of the month, the, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. For seven days, you must eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days, present food offerings to the Lord and on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Well, I'm a little bummed. This festival of unleavened bread has absolutely, positively nothing to do with the celebration of bread. Now, it obviously was an important festival because it's one of the few festivals that are mentioned throughout Moses' writings. It's mentioned in Leviticus 23, it's mentioned in Exodus 12, it's mentioned in Numbers 28, and it's mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 8. So this is something that was well known. And if you remember last week, where Passover started on the 14th day, this starts on the 15th day. So it started on the heels of Passover. So this was a Sunday service. You get that? So they celebrated Passover. They had all of that. And as they were cleaning up for Passover, and they're getting ready for the next day. There isn't going to be any sleep in, because guess what? There's another festival starting. And we'll talk about the first day of this festival next week. Just know that it started on a Sunday. What were they celebrating? Well, they were commemorating the exodus from Egypt. Exodus chapter 12, verse 17. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for generations to come. So they are celebrating not the day of Passover when, when God passed over. They are celebrating it's time to go home. We are leaving slavery. We are heading into freedom. And this was a seven-day festival. Okay, what am I going to do for these seven days? I don't get to celebrate bread. There's, no going to be, there's not going to be any yeast rolls. 
because they can't use yeast. So what are we going to do? Well, um, like most of the festivals, it began with a worship service to God. So the festival started, so keep in mind, we're coming out of Sabbath, and you aren't allowed to do any work on the Sabbath day, and that was a special Sabbath because that was Passover day, so you had all of that. And then the next day, instead of getting back to work, you have to take another day off from work. God says, take that day off and dedicate the day. It's not an hour worship service where you get up on Sunday morning and you come and you worship and the hour and a half clock ticks up and then you go home and you sit and... No. It was an all-day worship service. They started in the morning and they went till the evening. I don't know that we have many people sign up for that kind of a festival. I mean, that sounds kind of hard. Well, it is, but keep in mind there was a point to what God was doing because um, as... um. Most of it, it also involves some sacrifices. So if you have your copy of God's Word, make your way over to Numbers chapter 28, verses 19 through 23, because I really want you to see this. How many math people do we have here this morning that you just love math? How many people here like word problems? They are always the things that when they put them on the test, you're like, okay, you know, that's not fun. Well, just so you know, Numbers chapter 28, verses 19 through 23 is a word problem. So get ready to have to do a little bit of math. Because as you read down through there, God has a list of ways that they're supposed to sacrifice for this festival. You ready? Here you go. First thing you have to do is present to the Lord a food offering consisting of a burnt offering of two young bulls, one ram, and seven male lambs a year old without defect. So that means you're coming to your morning worship with two bulls, okay, with a male ram, okay, a grown male sheep, and seven little lambs coming back behind you. So this is what you're bringing to worship on the Festival of Unleavened Bread. That doesn't sound very much fun. I have a hard enough time sometimes getting my kids behind me. For, i got to bring all these animals with me to church? What kind of festival is this? Oh, we're not done. We're not done. You see, so you are also with each. Now, pay attention to that word. Keep your math mind on. With each bull, offer a grain offering of three tenths of an ephod of the finest flour mixed with oil. So you also had to make this oil and mixture, and you had to measure it out. And God said, by the way, measure it really careful because this is how much I want. Then he says, he goes on to say, well, also, with each of the, excuse me, with each, I'm leaving my offering of three tenths of flour, of the finest flour made with each of the seven lambs. So you also have to add, add something for the ram and the lambs. For the lambs, you have to take some more of this mix, and you have to put it in there, an ephod, and then you have to put two tenths with each of the lambs. So you have to go and figure it out. i got two bulls, so i got to multiply that, and I've got one ram, well, that's good, and then I've got seven of these lambs, so you're sitting here, And so before you get ready, because you couldn't do it the day before, that was Passover. So the morning that you're getting ready to do this, you're sitting here and getting your sacrifices ready to go. He's not done. Include one male goat for a sin offering. Who said you're not supposed to bring old goats to church? There you go. Include one male goat for a sin offering to to make an atonement for you. Now, there is an important word there, you. Therefore, it was one goat for every member of your household. Yuck. So I've already got two bulls. I've already got one ram. I've already got seven sheep. I've already got all all of this this mixture that I've made. And now I I got me and one goat for every person in your household. Ready to come to church now? That's a lot of stuff, don't you think? And you know what they're going to do with it, right? When you get to church, you don't get to go and sit down in the pew and have somebody sing to you. No, you're going to go stand in line. And when you get there, the kids, you know, the kids like, Can we, are we done yet? Are we done yet? Are we done yet? And you're going to be going down there, and you're going to have to stand in line. You're going to have to take all of this stuff and hand it over to the priest and stand there while he sacrifices it. Really? That doesn't sound like a festival to me. That sounds like an awful lot of work. Didn't God say do no work on this day? 
do no regular work is what the word says. It didn't say do no work, do no regular work. There was work involved in coming to this. And just when you think you're all done, offer these in addition to your regular morning burnt offerings. So there was a whole other series of offerings that you were supposed to offer every morning, and those are in another chapter. We'll save that study for another day. So not only did you have to bring all of this stuff, you had to bring all the other stuff that you normally would bring and offer to God. Whew. I'm glad it's only one day. Huh. Not quite. You see, these offerings had to be done daily during the festival. So that means you take, the, not the goat, the goat only got one day, but the rest of the food offering, daily. So for the next seven days, every morning you got up and you got together two bulls, one ram, seven sheep, all the mixture, and whatever else you were going to offer that morning, and off the church you went to stand in line, to sacrifice that which you had brought. That's a lot of animals. That's a lot going on here. Have you got it in the math? How many animals do you need? I didn't do the math for you folks. That's a lot. That's a lot. Because it's for seven solid days, plus the goats, depending on how many family members you have. That's a festival to God? Isn't it much easier if we just go and we throw darts at balloons and we eat funnel cake and we sit and listen to music? How can this possibly be a festival? But we ain't done. Because on the seventh day, after you finish offering all of that stuff, it says um, you're supposed to hold another sacred assembly and you don't get to do any day for the, any work on, do on that, that day anyway. I mean, that's a Sabbath, so you're not supposed to do any work anyway. So... So that's kind of a given rule there. But, but you get the picture here. For that entire week of your life, what are you going to be doing? You're either going to be preparing for sacrifice, sacrificing, or going home and resting from standing in line from sacrificing. Seven days worth. What do you think? Put this one back on our church calendar? Yeah, no. I don't know many people today that would sign up for something like that. That's crazy. And they weren't done. We haven't even talked about the bread yet. I mean, that's just the sacrifices. They also, for seven days, had to eat bread, no yeast allowed. So let me tell you about yeast. Um, it's important that you know that yeast is a living organism. Now, yeah, you... We're all adults here. We, we probably know this. And I didn't bring my little pop bottle with my balloon and my little mixture that will automatically blow the balloon up to show this. I thought about it, but I had a lot to do yesterday. No time to put together an object lesson this morning. But um, it's a living organism. Thus, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, um, it needs to eat and it needs to expel waste. That's how living organisms is. You, you eat and you expel waste. And his favorite food, it loves sugar. Okay? So you with me so far? And as it eats in the sugar, it burps. That word sounded a lot more fun than the other word that I could put there to expel waste. So you get it, the yeast is in your bread, and it's eating the sugar that's in your bread, and it is expelling gas. We'll call it burping, okay? And as it is expels the ga gas, the bread begins to rise as the yeast from the sugar that they eat is getting caught in the gluten of the bread, and the bread begins to rise. Wouldn't you love that? Give you a new look on that life when you see that big fluffy yeast roll. It's full of yeast gas, okay? Because that's what made it rise. And so for seven days, eight if you count Passover, because remember, no leaven on Passover, the Israelites were not allowed to consume bread with any yeast. By the way, that little saddie face, that's me. This is not a celebration about bread. This is a celebration 
about sacrifice. Because they were going to not have to put something into their life. They were going to have to take something out of their life. By the way, this little point, this is where kind of the idea of Lent comes in, of giving something up. This is where they took the idea of Lent from, from these passages. So the unleavened bread in the feast is a symbol of when the Israelites hastily left Egypt. Remember, this entire thing is about celebrating that day. And it says the Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise, they said, we will all die. Remember, we're coming out of Passover. A bunch of people died Passover night. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders and kneading through the wrapping cloth. So as they're leaving Egypt, the ladies, by the way, it was the ladies. The men didn't carry the bread. I'm sorry, ladies. I didn't make the rules. But they would have come out, and they would have had these bread loaves over top of them with no yeast in them, and they would have had them wrapped. And as they were leaving, they were kneading their bread because the Egyptians said, get out of here. What happened last night is never going to happen again. So they are hastily leaving, and this is a great picture for us because it needs to remind us that the Israelites were moving from slavery to freedom, and they were doing it with some urgency, folks. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. So this is what they're commemorating. So for seven days, no yeast allowed. Now, when I begin to think about yeast, though, there is some biblical meaning that goes with yeast when you come into our time. So we're going to leave the Israelites behind for right now, and we're going to go talk about what does this celebration mean to me? Because trust me, it does not mean that next week I want you to bring two bulls, one ram, seven sheep, a bunch of mixture, and some old goats in here and say, hey, Barry, will you sacrifice these for me? Because my answer is going to be no, okay? Because this is not how we celebrate, but there is something that we need to remember. Yeast in the New Testament. It was a symbol for false teaching. Matthew chapter 16, verse 6 through, 6, 16, 6 through 12. How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking about bread, but be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then, uh, then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So Jesus taught this whole lesson and told them to be on the lookout for yeast. And of course, just like most of us, they're thinking, I can't have bread that don't have yeast in it. They were thinking, make a religious symbol. And Jesus was saying, no, that's not what this is about. This is a metaphor. Okay, The yeast will represent false teaching that comes into your life. Ironically, we forget about this little verse a lot of times. Yeast also represents the growth of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 13, verse 33 says, He told them, still another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. And a, and a woman took and mixed it into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked through the dough. So Jesus is telling the parable. He said, hey, look, this woman was making bread and she took yeast. And she mixed it all into the dough, and that is the symbol for the kingdom of heaven. Yeast can also be about sin in the body of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. You are boast, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be new a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, so there's our connection back, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not only with, old, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of a sincere truth. So Paul takes this idea of the feast of the unleavened bread, he ties it back into how we as Christians are supposed to live our life. And that celebration wasn't for seven days. How long are you supposed to be taking the old yeast out of your life, which he classifies as sin, and putting Christ into your life? Well, that's a lifetime festival, right? That's what Christianity is. I am supposed to be coming more like Christ every single day. So I've got three metaphors here for yeast, but here's what I want you to see. 
the leaven, the yeast, is neutral. The yeast is just doing what it was designed to do, right? I mean, in the story, there in the stories, there were two stories where the yeast was considered a bad agent, and then one where the yeast is considered a good agent. So the yeast was neutral. In the New Testament, when they began talking about yeast, they weren't necessarily talking about good and bad. What they were talking about is whatever you put into your life will eventually consume it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9, a little yeast works throughout the whole batch of dough. So there are some good practical things that we need to understand. There is no such thing as a little bit of okay sin in your life. Let me say that again. There is no such thing as a little bit of okay sin in your life. You know why? It's called the yeast principle. If I put sin into my life, and I begin to work that sin in my life, and even if it just starts out as a little bitty bit, remember, the yeast is alive. So the yeast starts eating into your life and expelling its waste into your life, and it begins to multiply and begins to rise, and pretty soon... That little bit of sin that you have, it'll leaven the whole bunch. Of course, just like there is no such thing as a little bit of sin that can go into your life and be okay, I want you to let you know something else. You cannot have a little bit of Jesus in your life. If I take a little bit of anything and try to put it in your life to make you better from something, what do we call that in our society? We've had a lot of debate over this over the past few years. You realize that's called a vaccine. I take a little bit of something and put it into your life, and the idea isn't to get you sick. What am I, what am I trying to do? Make you immune from getting more. Hmm. So if I take just a little bit of Jesus, because, I mean, I, I want a little bit of Jesus because I want to go to heaven, right? So if I try to take a little bit of Jesus and put him into my life, you realize it isn't going to work. Because you can't just have a little bit of Jesus. Because the last time I checked the scorecard, Jesus isn't dead. He's alive. Therefore, if I take a little bit of living Jesus and put him into my life, then what's going to happen to living Jesus? He's going to multiply. And he's going to take in my life and output his gas, I guess and it will begin to rise in my life. And before you know it, my life is going to be full of Jesus. So you do get it, right? It's all or nothing. That's what they were trying to show them with all of that sacrificing, with all of that dragging those animals. You get what that meant. Their day was all or nothing for eight days. Their life became consumed with going to God with sacrifice in the Old Testament. Today, what is your life consumed with? I'm not talking about right now. We know what you're doing right now. What about the rest of the days? Would you count your Monday through Saturday consumed with God? Don't answer out loud. I want you to think about that. And if you really want to take the scorecard, how about I give you a little word problem? How about next, for the next seven days, we celebrate the festival a little bit differently? No, we're not sacrificing sheep, bulls, not doing that. But how about you just keep an account of how much for the next seven days you give God versus you give the rest of your life? Do you ever have a day that's totally consumed with God? Let's face it, we try to stick God in the cracks that we can make him fit because it doesn't work the way I want it. It's interesting that we talk about Jesus and Jesus is alive and active because Jesus himself called himself the bread of life. John chapter 6, verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which Gary talked about at our communion, which I give for you, give for your life, for, give for you, which I will give for the life of the world. 
And again, I hope you see those two words. He's living. He's not dead. This is not some stale loaf of bread that was left over from eons gone past. This is fresh bread today. For the word of God is active and alive and sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Remember, Jesus is the word, and he says, guess what? That word, it's going to give you life forever. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. God's wrath remains in them. Remember that all or nothing? The Israelites couldn't go back in the day of unleavened bread, and they couldn't celebrate the festival and say, you know what? They'll never even notice a little bit of leaven. I mean, who wants to have those dry, stale crackers when you can have moist, yummy yeast rolls? Which one would I pick? Yeah, I'm the yeast roll guy, seriously. They had to do an all or nothing because they knew once I put just that grain of yeast in it, it's going to affect everything else. And Jesus says, you know what? That's the way this works. Either you've allowed the sun into your life and he's growing and impacting your entire life or you have none. There's not some. There's not a little bit. There's only all or nothing. It's a yes or no question. Either you have accepted him or you haven't. There's no middle state. And then he goes on to tell them in that bread of life statement, I will give my life for the world. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, the authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. So you need to realize how this works. You've heard this probably, what, thousands of times in your life. Jesus came, physically came into this world. Jesus lived 33 years on this planet. Jesus gave his life. Nobody murdered Jesus. I have heard those sermons my entire life, and you know what? Nobody murdered Jesus. Like all of those lambs, like all of those bulls, like all of that, those sheep, like those goats that they had to gather for their sin that were led off to the altar to be sacrificed, well, They were just animals. They had no idea what was really going to happen. They thought, oh, good, walk. Jesus came knowing full well what he was going to do. He gave his life for each and every one of us. They buried him in the tomb, and they're thinking, well, that's done with. Next chapter. But on the third day, he came rolling out of the tomb. And now, folks, we have something to celebrate. He gave the question you have to ask yourself, have you received? So right now I need you to picture yourselves as just a batch of lumpy bread dough. I'm good at that. I got my lumpy, okay? Picture yourself as a batch of lumpy bread dough, and now it's that moment. We're going to add the thing in your life that's going to eventually define your life. What are you going to add? The life you're living in sin? or the life you want with Jesus. You know what you can't add? Both. Because they are both all-consuming. You must choose. I found this quote, and I just did not want to let it go. Just like the celebration of our old, of the celebration of old, our relationship with Jesus is a lifelong, all-consuming relationship, and I hope you caught it, We have a responsibility to pass on to the next generation. We send our kids downstairs because we're going to talk about it for just a second here. You get it, right? They are our responsibility. They're not our burden. They're not our pastime. They are our responsibility. And our responsibility isn't necessarily to always be harsh on them, although I'm good at that part. You get I my responsibility is to show them the yeast in my life. 
So what is defining your life? The sin of your old life? Or the Jesus of your new life? If I was to bring the kids back up here and bring each adult walking by here one by one and ask those kids, define the adult standing in front of you, what are you passing on to them? Is it merely the do's and don'ts and sin? Or is it a life eternal with Jesus? Wow. Remember, they were supposed to celebrate this celebration for generations to come. Are they still celebrating this today in Israel? Not the way they do this. There are no sacrifices still going on in Israel. But as a church, I think sometimes we do need to set aside some days. Not a day, not an hour, but some days linked together where we dedicate everything to God. Put our life on hold. How inconvenient would that be for you? Just like the celebrations of old, our relationship with Jesus is to be a living, it is to be a living, lifelong, and all-consuming relationship we sacrifice to accept and deliberately pass on to the next generation. Welcome to the feast of unleavened bread. Hopefully you decided what are you going to put in it next.